Hey guys, this is Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be a part of this time of online learning and growing together. Uh, we're going to be looking together tonight in Acts, the 19th chapter, verses 11 through 41. We're going to continue our study in the life of the Apostle Paul. And tonight we want to focus in on this one statement. God's work must be done in God's power. Uh, we're going to dive into that deeper this evening, so please look in Acts, the 19th chapter, and find verse 11. That's where we're, going to, where we're going to begin this evening. While you're turning there, let me thank you again for uh, tuning in. I am honored that I get to be a part of your spiritual development, and I'm thankful that you're a part of mine as well. Uh, last week, we talked about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We read in the scripture how there were disciples in Ephesus who had not even heard about the Holy Spirit, not to mention having been filled with him. Well, Paul taught them about this work of grace, and they experienced it for themselves. And they now had the power to be the witnesses that God needed them to be and to live the life that God wanted them to live. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit is really for. It's the Spirit of God living within us, empowering us to be both witnesses to the grace and the mercy of God, and also to live the kind of life that God wants us to live. We ended last week and talked about how it is we have this experience. Let me recap that very quickly. Jesus said in Luke the 11th chapter, verses 9 through 13, these words, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would he give him a serpent instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, would he give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The way we have this experience, my friends, is that first we realize we need it. And then we, just as the children of God, asking our Heavenly Father, just as an earthly child would ask their earthly father, to give them this good gift. We ask and we receive by faith. Now the way, the number one way that you know you've had this experience is by the fruit of the Spirit being born out in your life. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 22 through 26, we find these words. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. These nine qualities or attributes or things that we Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit are the indicators that the Spirit of God is working within you now and, and dwelling in you. Now, each of these things in and of themselves are worthy of a whole lesson or message. And by the way, I'm about to conclude a series on Sunday mornings talking about the fruit of the Spirit. So if you want to look on our YouTube channel, God is Good on the Hood, uh, you can find those services, okay? But the, the Holy Ghost... When you give your life to, to Christ and when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost uh, sanctifying you or uh, filling your life does not take away your human desires. Okay, I, I want to be clear about that. You still are a human being. But when we get filled with God's Spirit, we go back to a point of restoring those desires in a way that God intended them to be expressed and restored before sin entered into the world. Uh, a lot of people think that um, being a Christian and being a spirit-filled Christian is a lot like maybe having to go on a healthy diet. Have you ever been on one of those diets, you know, where basically if it tastes good, you got to spit it out? That, that's no fun, right? Well, that's how a lot of people view living the Christian life. If it's any fun at all, if there's any joy or pleasantries involved with it, you can't do it. You know, if you're a spirit-filled Christian, you just got to be gloom and doom all the time and have a, 
sour look on your face. Well, that's not the case. If you go back and you read in Genesis, God made us in his image and he created us to, to enjoy life. And before sin entered the world, there, there are some key human desires that are identified there in creation. And the thing about it is these, these human desires that are given to us by God, they're God-given desires that need to be satisfied in God-honoring ways. Now, all of that was going well until sin entered the world. And once sin entered the world, the enemy of our souls started working to exploit these God-given desires and to get us to satisfy them in ways that does not bring glory to God. Um, I can kind of explain it maybe like this. After I really gave myself completely to God, my human desires didn't go away, but that experience impacted the habits that I, were going to, that I was going to continue to have. It made me change some of my habits. It, it changed my vocabulary. I just got to tell you flat out, there are some words that I won't use anymore that I used to use. Even after I'd gotten saved, I kept using because I thought it was okay. But after the Spirit really came into my life, it made me rethink, He made me rethink, rather, uh, the, some of the words that I use. It, it made me rethink, it's, it's continuing to make me rethink the whole idea of gossip, even. Uh, you know, I don't need to know everything that's going on in somebody's life. And if I know something that's going on, I don't need to share it with other people who don't need to know. Okay? Um, it's, it changed my, it impacted my habits, my vocabulary. It impacted my relationships. And it impacted my priorities. When you let the Spirit of God fill your life, you become more in tune with what God wants. And little by little, our heart's desires get in line with God's heart's desires and our priorities begin to change. My friends, it is a wonderful, wonderful experience that is needed in the life of the believer so that we can live the life that God wants us to live and we can be the witnesses that God wants us to be. I can safely tell you this. I don't want to live life in my own power anymore. I know what that's like, and I don't, I don't want to go back to that. That does not help anybody. God's not glorified by that. I'm not helped by that. There's just nothing good that's going to come from that, okay? So the Spirit filled, this, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is something that believers need to have. And the Ephesian believers had this, but then we see Paul had already had this experience, and there were some other things that, that were going on in Paul's life. He was doing ministry in the power of God. God was working through him in some very unique ways. Let's look at that tonight in Acts, the 19th chapter, beginning at verse 11. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Look at what's going on here. Paul, a spirit-filled believer, uh, ministers to some Ephesian believers who had not even heard of the Holy Spirit. They got filled with the Holy Spirit, and Paul goes on doing some ministry that was miraculous. Now, this was the power of God working through Paul. In this particular case, there were these unusual miracles that were taking place there were um, you know Paul would have handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his body and they would be taken to people who were sick and miraculously those people would be healed my friends there's no way to explain that except by the power of God and the spirit of God not only bears forth the fruit in our lives but he also gives us spiritual gifts to use for his glory now, we don't want to just hone in on one gift or another gift. It's whatever gift God chooses to give us that we're to use to bring glory to his name. And in this case, it was the gift of healings that was happening in a rather unusual way. And interestingly enough, there's no other portion of Scripture recording healings occurring by taking a handkerchief or an apron from somebody like this. 
Okay, uh, th this may have very well been just something God chose to do in that particular moment. Not the healing part, but the fact that aprons or handkerchiefs were used as a part of it. Now, here's the deal. God can do whatever he wants to whenever he wants to. And if that's a method that he still wants to continue to use, praise God. Let's, uh, let's trust him for that. And I, I've been a part of services where there have been people who were sick who could not come and we've anointed a, ha a handkerchief on behalf of that person. And we just prayed over the prayer of faith and we took that to them as a token of our faith and trusted God to, um, to do what only he could do. Now, that's a method. That's a method that we see uh, introduced here in uh, Acts, the 19th chapter. Uh, but it doesn't mean that that's the only method that God can bless or use or that he's going to continue to go that route. Um, what, what is most important to take, into, uh, to, to take note of here is that God did healing through the Apostle Paul. Now, just as an example, you know, when Jesus was walking in this world, during his earthly ministry, at one point, he healed a man with clay and spittle. He basically spat in the mud, or on some dirt, made mud out of it, and, and he healed a guy by way of that. But there, there's no other recording in the scripture of Jesus healing in that particular way. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't. It just really means that we don't have a written record of it. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Uh, we don't want to assume that God is going to work the same way twice. Um, now, what are you trying to say, Ray? Do you think God's not going to heal? No, I believe God can and will bring healing. I'm just saying we don't have to necessarily assume that it's going to be with handkerchiefs or apron or spitting uh, on dirt and making clay out of it. What we want to focus on is through the power of the Spirit, asking God to do what only He can do. Here's what we've got to keep in mind. We can't do God's work in human power. And we're about to see an example of some guys who tried to do that as we pick it up in verses in verse 13 and go through verse 16 of Acts 19. And some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, who a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And then the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was, was leaped upon them, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Look at what's happening here. Paul is doing these great miracles through the power of God, the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. And these itinerant exorcists see Paul doing this particularly seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish uh, priest, and they think, hey, we're going to just use this same name that Paul's using, the name of Jesus Christ, and we're going to do get the same results that, that he's getting. That was not the case, my friends. You see, they didn't have a relationship with God through the Son, Jesus Christ. They had not themselves been filled with the Spirit of God. They were trying to do God's work in human power. And my friends, it just does not work. In this case, they got beat up, got their clothes torn off of them, and they left wounded and embarrassed. Okay? Um, this is not the way God intended his work to be done. You have to know him in order to do the, and be filled with his spirit in order to do the work that he's called our, us to do. You cannot do God's work in human power. Don't try. It's not going to end well. Well, what happened next in this particular account is that the fear of God came into this community. In verses 17, 17 through 19 of Acts 19, we read these words. Then it became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds, and also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Look at what's going on now. Paul, who is a follower of Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit of God, 
does mighty works in the power of God. Some other people tried to do the same thing, but they didn't have a relationship with God through the Son, Jesus Christ, and hadn't been filled with the Holy Spirit. And they got spanked for it. They got embarrassed for it. They got beat up, actually, for it. They got overpowered by evil for it. And word about that spread throughout the entire community. And when people heard about this, they realized, oh my goodness, there's a God in heaven and I had better get right with him. They came confessing their deeds according to the scripture. They, they came in repentance. They started giving up all of this stuff that was not of God. They had trusted in, in witchcraft, basically, in, in other kind of magical powers that were not from the Lord and were not God-honoring. And they, as a sign of repentance took all of their material that they had acquired in, the, in studying the arts of exorcism through whatever means, and they, they burned it up. Man, praise God for true revival that was taking place. And thank God that godly fear fell on this community. Oh, my friends, we need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, and we need a fresh sense of, of godly fear in our lives and in our communities. Look at how this changed people's lives. In the Beacon Commentary, uh, this statement is made concerning fear. Fear often produces conviction and a whole lot of honesty. Uh, I've kind of been there and done that. How about you? I can remember one time a lady that I pastored talked about getting on an airplane and uh, she was a Christian lady, but boy, uh, that airplane ride was excessively turbulent. And <laughs> her own words were this. Sometime during that flight, I knew I was saved, but I prayed again just to make sure everything was okay. Um, now, that's kind of funny, but it proves a point. When, when we get scared, when, when honest fear comes along, we just, it makes us get honest with ourselves and just kind of make sure everything's right. Well, godly fear is a healthy thing. And godly fear fell on this community. And again, the sign of repentance that they showed of getting rid of all that stuff that they didn't need. Um, man, that's something we can learn from today as well. When we come to true repentance, we need to get rid of that stuff in our lives that's not going to help us be closer to God. Uh, in this case, they were burning up books that had that taught them how to do magic or uh, you know the things they did they didn't need to be doing. And it totaled fifty thousand pieces of silver. The New King James Version says that is well over ten thousand dollars worth of books and material. Now that's that's nothing to sneeze at. Okay, and by the way. Uh, I can remember when I got saved, I got rid of some things, but when the Spirit filled my life, there are a whole lot of other things that the Spirit of God began showing me that I needed to physically get rid of that uh, wasn't helping me be more like Christ. And sometimes those were things, and in some cases those were relationships. And God has a way of showing us things and maybe even people that we need to distance ourselves from if we're truly going to draw close to him. So please take note of that. Well, uh, there was a result of their open repentance found in verse 20. And it says simply this, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Basically, my friends, revival broke out. People began repenting and God began moving in a mighty way. Well, at this point, Paul begins senses, sensing the Spirit leading him to another place of ministry. Verses 21 and 22 of Acts 19 says this, When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to uh, go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, uh, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. 
So Paul did what he was supposed to do in that particular area. <coughs> Excuse me, for a time. He did, it in, he did God's work and God's power. And then the Spirit of the Lord began leading him to go somewhere else. And he took action on that. So please take note of that. There's a time to do what you're supposed to do. And you do it for that time. And then you keep doing it for that time as long as the Lord is in it. But then if the Lord wants you to go somewhere else or go do something else, he'll guide you into that. That's part of the Spirit's work in our lives. We are filled with the Spirit, and He leads us into truth. He gives us power to live and to witness for Him. He gives us power, in some cases, to do miraculous things for Him. But then He also guides us to where He wants us to go. Sometimes He says stay and do keep doing what you're doing, but other times it may be going somewhere else. Well, how do you know uh, which is which, Brother Ray? Well, that's why you've got to walk in the Spirit and listen closely to Him. That's what Paul was doing. So revival had broken out in one area. But oftentimes, as we've seen through the scripture, when revival breaks out, sometimes a riot is not too far to follow. If you look in Acts, the 19th chapter, beginning at verse 23, and you read through verse 34, you would kind of get this account. There was a, a silversmith named Demetrius who was really upset with what was going on. Because you see, he made these little idol images of the great goddess Diana. And in Ephesus, the big church in town was the temple of Diana. Now, Diana was a pagan god, a god of fertility. And the people there practiced paganism and worshipped that particular false god. And Demetrius and other silversmiths made their living by selling these little idols that they could take to their, people could take to their home and set up as a shrine to uh, Diana. Well, suddenly, as people are getting saved, they're realizing uh, we don't need to go to the temple of Diana anymore because she's a false god. We need to worship the one true God of heaven. Well, Demetrius and the other silversmiths didn't really like that. And Demetrius is the head guy who kind of got everything together. He called the silversmiths union together and he said, Hey guys, we better do something about this or we're going to go broke. Now that's not how he spun it to the public. What he basically says is this. These people are teaching things that are going to not only affect our bottom line, but they're insulting our God. He got religion all of a sudden, okay? And uh, all these silversmiths started turning against the ministry team that Paul was leading in that area. And they, they, they got the people all riled up, and they were about to beat them up. And they, they just had this gathering. If you read through the verses, in this gathering, they're just shouting for hours about uh, how great Diana is and how uh, these guys that they, they're wanting to get rid of and put in jail or whatever, maybe even kill, they're, they're the ones who are causing all this trouble. Well, here's the bottom line, my friends. Uh, and when revival really breaks out, it would mess with some people's pocketbooks. Do you know if in a community, the majority of the people really got right with God, um, the pornography business would dry up in that area. Do you know if people really got right with God, there, there wouldn't be uh, prostitution in that community. If men really loved their wives and, and, and uh, just treated them like they're supposed to and loved them like Christ loves the church and, and wives were honoring and respecting their husbands and loving them and there were just these great relationships there, you know, there would be very little need for divorce attorneys. Those attorneys would have to find some other form of law. And can you imagine if there were men and women in a community who, while they were single, decided they were going to honor God with their bodies and they weren't going to participate in illicit activity? Man, what a 
what a blessing that would be to that community, but it would affect some of the businesses in that community. What if people decided that they weren't going to um, get drunk? Alcohol sales would go down drastically. Uh, you know, the, the, the drug sales, the illegal drug problem that is prevalent in so many communities, including ours, those guys would have to go somewhere else if the majority of the people really got saved. My friends, when revival happens, it can impact some people's pocketbook. And when you start messing with somebody's bottom line, those people get mad. That's what's happening in Acts the 19th chapter, verses 23 through 34. And Paul really wants to go in and try to help people settle down. And everybody with him says, Paul, you do that, man. They're going to kill you. You need to get out of here. Well, finally, as we wrap this up in this portion of the scripture and for this lesson tonight, in this particular instance, it was interesting that a politician steps in and settles the people down. Pick it up in Acts the 19th chapter, verses 35 through 41. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that this is, is the city of the Ephesians, its temple guardian of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. <laughs> Look at what's happening here. This riot that was about to break out was among Jewish people. And the Romans were going to have to send in some military people to get things settled down. And boy, if them Roman soldiers would have showed up, it wasn't going to be pretty. Well, the whole reason this uproar happened is because um, Demetrius and his fellow silversmiths were concerned about the fact that they were going to be losing money or they were already losing money. And while none of the believers could intervene at this point, this politician speaks up and he says, the city clerk, he says, hey guys, we know that uh, it, the Ephesians are, are the guardians of the great goddess Diana. And he, he settles these people down a little bit, but he basically, in a, the form of a good politician, He's trying to play both sides of the, the court here. Now, the good news is he did get the crowd settled for the moment. He did appeal to their common sense after he appealed to the fact that, hey, there's nobody that's going to get rid of Diana altogether here, which is a sad thing. True revival would have gotten rid of Diana. Um, but after he got people to calm down and they began to reason a little more, he pointed them in the direction of, going through a lawful assembly to, to accuse Paul and his friends. And they probably really didn't even want to do that. But the, the interesting point as we wrap this up is that a politician did settle things down for the moment. So you can take that for whatever it's worth. As we wrap up tonight, let me encourage us to remember that this work of the Holy Spirit in our lives produces fruit in our lives and gives us the power to do the things God wants done. My friends, I believe with all my heart that God wants to do a great work in you and through you. But you cannot do that, that great work. That work will not be done in your own power. I encourage you, give yourself completely to God and let his Holy Spirit fill you completely. And then let him do in and through you what only he can do. And I pray those great things take place. I pray revival happens in you. And I pray God uses you to help revival take place anywhere and everywhere you go. May it be so. Thank you for your time. God bless you and have a great evening.